when we were reading about Jesus and his activities on earth, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that last song brings to mind the fact of the power of the Lord, that he can simply say to the storm, peace, be still, and it stops. When you stop and think about all of the physical laws that exist and know that they were all spoken into existence by God and that they continue to exist and function as he intended because he upholds them by the word of his power, then that should cause us to recognize the God that we serve and his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and how if that is the case in material things, how much more so is it the case in spiritual matters? We talk about the Bible, and rightly so, as the Word of God. We emphasize the New Testament as the Word of Jesus Christ, the last will and testament of Christ. In it is found the way of salvation. This morning I want to speak to you uh, regarding the matter of being holy. You might call it preserving holiness. For those outside of Christ, it might cause them to realize what conversion is. That God expects the people who are His children, who have obeyed the gospel, whose past sins are remitted and they've been added to the church by the Lord Himself, to live a life befitting the name Christian that they wear. We'll be looking, although we won't read it because it's lengthy, but you might want to mark it in your book. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, and going all the way into chapter 2 and verse 20. 1 Peter 1, 13, beginning, and through chapter 2 and verse 20. Now you will find that in reading these verses, he dwells on the idea of each one of us as Christians being holy. People scoff at holiness. And yet the Bible talks about a holiness that is from God. It even refers to God as being holy. And I will note this one verse as to the reason that we should preserve holiness in our lives and realize that we are to live a converted life, a holy life. Peter writes here in verse 15, But as he which hath called you is holy... So be ye holy in all manner of conversation, that is, in all areas of your living. Then he says in verse 16, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Of course, that comes from the Old Testament, Leviticus 11:44. Now, Leviticus is a book written to the tribe of Levi, but that's the priestly tribe. And if the priests under the law of Moses were not as God said they should be, Israel couldn't be in its approach to God what God intended. But in the church, as Peter will point out, each member of the Lord's church, each Christian, each citizen of the kingdom of heaven is a priest. And thus we offer up sacrifices as befitting who we are as Christians of Christ. Now, holiness defined according to Vine's Expository Dictionary in New Testament words is a noun which signifies a separation to God. Thus, the word saint comes in. Saint is a sanctified person. And it equates with holiness. Holiness meaning you are dedicated to God. Now, you couldn't be dedicated to God and the service of God if you couldn't get rid of your sins. Because they separate between men and God, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23, separation from God. Thus, to become holy, one must go through the process of becoming holy, of hearing the gospel, understanding it, believing it, repenting of sins, confessing one's faith in Christ as the Son of God, and being baptized into the only doorway into Christ, into Christ for the remission of sins. Galatians 3.27, Acts 2.38. Now in Christ is where people are holy. They're new creatures in Christ. They're from the heart viewing things completely different. They have died 
to the ways of the world. They're alive to the things that pertain to godliness. Thus, they're separated from the way most of the world lives by their own belief and obedience to the gospel. They've been raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3 and 4. So this is a state which has been predetermined by God for those who would be his children. In other words, God predetermined people to be holy. And that didn't rule out the fact that some could reject the gospel message. Many have, many will. But it says that you are able to benefit from what God has predetermined by your acceptance of the truth and willingness to comply with it. 1 Peter 1 and 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God and the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience. And there it is. Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. And we are the elect, the church is. God foreknew this before time was, that through sanctification of the Spirit, which comes through obedience to the gospel, we are raised to be obedient children, to be active in the service of God, to live contrary and against the ways of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3, Paul said, for this is the will of God. And I pause here and say, well, what is the will of God? Well, he's writing to Christians and he says, even your sanctification. Now this occurs when he calls us to him through the gospel. You become a Christian through understanding the glad tidings of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. But look at persevering. I should say preserving. One is not going, I would suggest you keep both those in mind. To persevere is to stick with something. That's the only way you can preserve what God intends you to be. Holy. Now, preserving is defined to keep or save from injury or destruction. To, the, to defend from evil. To save. To keep the same state. To uphold. Sustain. Guard. To save from decay. That's how Webster defines it. So we're talking about how do we remain saved? Well, we must be holy, even as God is holy. So God's authored a system where we can be holy before Him, even as He is holy. Does that mean we reach a stage of perfection where there's no more any possibility of sin? No. Thanks be to God, He's authored a system that keeps us covered by the saving blood of Christ as we walk in the light as He is in the light. And thus, as God views us, He does not include us with all those who are rebellious against Him or have apostatized. I think you can learn a lot from the Passover of Israel by God in Egypt just before they left. Moses had been told by God that if you'll put blood of the lamb on the lintel and doorpost, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Well, that was written aforetime for your learning and my learning. And when we were baptized into Christ, the blood of Christ shed for the mischief of sins was applied to us as believing, repentant persons. John tells us, as we are to be holy, then the blood continues to cleanse. And notice what is written in 1 Peter 1 and verse 1. He says it's to the stranger. The American Standard Version 1901 says sojourners. It says scattered throughout this given area. One of the things that would help us immensely in being holy is to realize I'm here just for a little bit of time. That I'm a traveler, just traveling through. And I don't need to put down roots because they can't hold. I'm expecting to leave this world any time. You don't know when that's going to be. Any more than you know when the Lord's going to come back. And the longer we live, the realize how brief and uncertain life of the flesh is. <clears throat> How many people are dead today that last night went to sleep without a concern? 
And yet there should be then on our parts, because of what we know in order to become Christians and that we have become Christians, that we must be holy day in and day out. So there were people that Peter wrote to who were once separated from God by their sins, dead in trespasses and sins, but now they're spiritually alive. And they're to present their bodies living sacrifices to God as they walk through this strange land as pilgrims. This place is not our home. If you still think that in the body on this earth is home, there's something terribly wrong with your growth and development in Christ. The Christian whose real home is heaven then is only a pilgrim and is only a sojourner in this land. Our home is beyond this world. The present day Christian must also guard his actions in view of his destiny. And that is eternity. And for the faithful child of God, heaven itself. Let me pause here and say I'm fully aware of the fact that this is Father's Day. A good day even as we have Mother's Day. But if I would say anything to anybody about being a good husband and father, <clears throat> being a good wife and mother for that matter, is to be holy. That means you're seeking the Lord's will as to how you're to be a father or how you're to be a mother. So if you want a Father's Day sermon, then I think it's a good one. Fathers, be holy, as God said and Peter wrote, even as I am holy. And you'll be whatever you ought to be to your wife, the mother of your children, and your children. You'll heed the teachings of the Bible concerning your role and your responsibilities in life because you will take them to yourself as in service to God. We know Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Well, if there ever was an exhortation in the Bible that needs to be embedded in our inner man, in our very core of our being, it's this one. It ought to ever be in our minds. We have a relationship to God. We have been sanctified by our obedience to the truth. We are holy and presented to Him as such. And there are very, very few people walking on this earth today that have that great blessing. Therefore, we're exhorted to the daily task of preserving holiness in our lives. Now look at verse 13 of our passage. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> this terminology we don't use anymore, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind. We are to have our minds being ready unto every good work, geared up, bound up, to be able to be decisive in what we're about on this earth, in the direction we're going, in the things we're going to do. It troubles me greatly all through my long years of preaching to see some people, members of the church for years, and they have to really fight every Saturday or Sunday morning or whenever it is if they're going to be at the assemblies of worship for that day. Well, you know, that was settled for me when I became a Christian a long, long time ago. I never have to make up my mind to do that. Well, what about the fellow who says, I'm around all this foul language, so I've got to make up my mind every day. Am I going to engage in it? Well, for the child of God who's genuinely converted, as the Bible defines conversion, that settled a long time ago. As is the study of the Bible, as is prayer, as is anything else that says we are holy and dedicated to God. Matthew 5, 6 tells us why a lot of folks just don't get there. And it's in the Beatitudes. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. There are a lot of folks who want to know the Bible, but they don't have, as it were, a hungry and thirsting attitude about getting it. You all, I'm sure, have been at times very thirsty. Nothing was going to help you but that you could get a long 
drink of cool water. My, it was fine. Until that attitude is in the soul of a man concerning the word of the living God and knowing it and practicing it. You'll never go where your intellect says you ought to go. And you confess that you should. We must be firm in our convictions. I've already mentioned 1 Corinthians 15, 58. If we're holy, we'll be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's the way you preserve holiness in your life. There's no room for half-converted people. The Bible's full of material on that. Jesus taught it in his earthly ministry in Matthew 10, 34 through 39. <clears throat> you can't serve God with reservations. If you say, well, I'll give you 90% of my life, but in this area, I'm going to do it like I want to. Don't mess around here. Then you're not going to be on his side. You'll be rejected. We must not let, if you want to use this terminology, keeping with the way the Holy Spirit had him right in their day and age, in their dress, we must not let our garments hang loose. In those days and still in those countries where they wear those loose-fitting garments, when they get down to working, they pull them up and tie a sash across get them up out of the way because they're at work. And that's the way we are as faithful children of God. When you traveled in those days, that's what you did. And so, speaking spiritually, as the temple of the Lord, as holy people, then we don't let anything hinder us in preparing ourselves to exercise our talents in the service to God. So you see, he's talking about being energetic. How many of us would consider our lives as energetic in service to God, as active, constantly striving to Learn what we can do for the Lord. Of course, Christ is our example. Paul, in writing to the Philippians, said, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching toward those things which are before. Notice the intensity. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I emphasize in Christ Jesus. That shows his relationship and every Christian's relationship to God. We are in Christ Jesus, where Paul also said, it's in Christ Jesus where God's located every spiritual blessing. That's where you're holy, Ephesians 1, 3. So this should be a state of mind for all who are Christians. 1 Peter 4 and verse 7. And there Peter writes, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Well, we don't know when this world's going to end. We don't know when the Lord's coming back. And we don't know when we're going to die. The younger you are, it seems like, well, that always has to do with somebody else. But there are countless young people dead today that were thinking that yesterday. Be sober. It's to have a temperate disposition. You exercise self-control under the will of Jesus Christ. This is the reason God's elder, if you please, as they are set out as the qualifications, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus 1, must be an elder of age and maturity, <clears throat> spiritual age and maturity, of having put into practice being holy or living a sanctified life. So if we're to defeat the devil in our lives, then we must approach God in a mature manner. There's just no other way to say it. Now, how do I know what that maturity is? Well, I can't sit here and cover all of it today. I can simply say if you're studying your Bible every day, you're going to find how to live the Christian life set out in the New Testament of Christ. I can look over here for a moment at a passage of Scripture that might give us an idea because it's uh, designed to do that. In Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 13, he's about to close that letter. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against uh, the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Then the last verse, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Having done all to stand. That's the whole idea. 
what am I to do? I am to stand. Stand in the knowledge and practice of the truth pertaining to being holy, preserving holiness in my life. He says, set your hope perfectly on the grace, the favor of God as it's revealed in the New Testament. Verse 3. The Jews, by rejecting God, had lost their hope. Through the traditions of men and then binding them and setting aside the law of Moses for those things, they gave up really what they should be looking for. Thus, Peter would tell them on the day of Pentecost, and they were devout men, gathered out of every nation under heaven. You have taken them with wicked hands, have crucified and slain the Son of God. We must know then that we have received the blessing of being incorruptible and undefiled in the hope of our crown of life in heaven. It doesn't fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you. That's the attitude that ought to be, is no, noticing I have a reserved place in heaven. I don't think we think that way like we ought to. But if you're faithful to God, you have a place reserved for you in heaven. Who are kept or guarded, as the ASV says, by the power of God through faith into salvation, it's eternal salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. <clears throat> it's hard for us because all I've ever experienced is life in the flesh, in the material world. Very difficult for us to see all of this gone. Try to even imagine it, that it's all gone. The way I think and move now relative to the affairs of this world will not be here any longer. The way the whole social system works, regardless of the little nuances between social systems, or the cultures that are in different nations of this world, all of that is swept away. There's nothing material left. There are no physical laws. There are no biological laws. There's none of that. That's all been taken away. When the elements melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are in, Peter talks about being burned up. But what saves us? It's our trust in God and obedience to the gospel and preserving the holiness set out in the New Testament for children of God. In verses 14 and 15, he says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or the way that you live. What characterizes a faithful child of God? Obedience. Do you see why that the devil in one way or the other constantly tries to say, you're free, do as you please. You don't have to do that. Don't let anybody push you this way or that way. You choose your own route. I did it my way. God is simply telling us, you can't do it your way. Not and go to heaven. You've got to be humble before God and his will with an obedient disposition. And you know that, speaking of fathers again, that ought to be instilled in every godly family from the beginning. You must be obedient. That faithfulness in God and things holy demands obedience on your part. I've never thought that children, especially when they were small and their parents told them to do something, and maybe they're old enough to say why, <clears throat> the psychologist says, don't say, because I said so. But if you are what you ought to be as a mom and daddy, and all the Bible talks about it, God has no problem as our Heavenly Father telling us, you do it because I said so. If you want to try to train and teach children, teach them implicit obedience. Now, does that mean as they grow older you don't deal with them accordingly? Of course not. You explain and teach as they're able to understand. But we don't live in a world that encourages compliance with rules. If there's a rule that it basically says to a great many people, it's there to be broken. And that's called rebellion. You see it in our land. You see it in homes. But you don't see it in the life of the faithful Christian who is being holy even as God is holy. So we must instill that in children as soon as able to understand anything. Notice Romans 6, 17 and 18, where Paul talks about what the Romans did in becoming Christians. And he says that they obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered them, being then made free from sin. 
you became servants of righteousness, Romans 6, 17, 18. I want to concentrate on became servants of righteousness. That's the holiness we're speaking of. A holy person is a servant of righteousness. Now, the Greek there means bond slave. We elected, when we obeyed the gospel and becoming a Christian, to say, I'm becoming a slave to Jesus Christ. Only he knows how to get me from here to heaven. He's blazed the trail and left the map in the New Testament. Only I can live, as the New Testament teaches, in the sense of my personal responsibility and dedication to God. So the child of God views the situation in the light of what can be accomplished for God. I don't know when we're making our plans that we stop and think, well, what can we do for the church and the cause that God has laid upon it. Since I'm a member of it, and I'm to be holy even as He is holy, what are we going to do when it comes to how much time we're spending, which should be all the time one way or the other, in carrying out the will of God? So, verse 22, 1 Corinthians 9, I have made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So only then, when we have that attitude, can holiness in our lives be preserved before God? In other words, we stay faithful. Then he says, not fasting yourselves according to your former lust. Once you become a Christian, that doesn't mean you can't go back to the ways of the world. If you continue to do what you did before you obeyed the gospel, then you're going back to forming your character, your view, your ideas, the way you live in the ways of the world. And the ways of the world certainly doesn't submit to the truth of God. And we're warned one way or the other, such as in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, not to drift back to the world. That takes vigilance to stay with the truth. We have to renew things. You may have learned them years ago, but you have to renew them. Because I prayed as I ought yesterday, and I studied my Bible yesterday, and I may have done that for years and years, that does not give me the right to say, I can skip today. And that's the way it is with all things pertaining to life and godliness. We're not even to cultivate a desire to be like the people of the world. Paul wrote, as we're familiar with, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, there's our word, acceptable unto God, and he says, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The mind's renewed when it grows in the knowledge of the truth and thereby understanding how God wants us to be. And then we submit ourselves to it and we live holy lives. 1 Peter 2 and 9 speaks of us being a peculiar people. Or as the American Standard says, a people for God's own possession. Peculiar here comes from our English word, pecuniary. Usually we say you're a peculiar person because you're strange in some way, at least from our viewpoint. Not what it means here. Although Christians living righteous lives in an ungodly world may seem strange to the world. What it means here is you're a purchased possession. You are where you are now because Christ has purchased you with his blood. You couldn't be holy if it wasn't for Christ tasting death for all men. And that's the idea, and that's why the American Standard said a people for God's own possession. I belong to him. I said earlier, looking at Romans 6, 17 and 18, I chose to become a slave to Christ. I put the chain on me because he's the only way to go to heaven. Now, the word is for all who will respond to it. This is what he says, 2 Peter 1 and 3. According as his divine power hath granted unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Well, how? Notice the preposition through. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. We learn what's right from the Bible. But that doesn't do any good if we don't have the idea to submit ourselves to what he said we're to be doing. That's how we're servants. And Paul told Timothy we were to be proper servants in 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 21. 
chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, where the Word had free course in our lives. And we pray that the Word has free course. Then we're saying that we heed the admonitions of God. That we will be free from the things of this world. Will we pray that the gospel will have free course in America or anywhere else? We're praying that its influence, as God intended it to influence, will be felt. Will be seen in the lives of men and women, boys and girls who listen and accept it as the word of God. Now why is this important? Because only then can holiness be preserved. And when the church, which is to be the leavening for good in this world, in a wicked world, when the church loses sight of this, it can't be what God intends, and God is not well pleased. Only through Christ does man have a perfect view of our Heavenly Father. As much as one can in the flesh on this earth, John 1, verse 18, chapter 14, 1 through 10, <clears throat> he says, but like as he, I'm trying to be like Christ. I'm trying to live as he wills me to live, which will is set out in the words of the New Testament, the perfect law of liberty, James 1, 25. Jesus in, in the flesh is man's view of the Godhead. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2 and verse 9. Because the second person of the Godhead is God, when that person indwelt flesh, then he was God in the flesh. John 1, 14. He endured every trial in the right spirit so we could have him, I'm going to use his terminology, to fall back on. Hebrews uh, deals with that. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. <clears throat> Seeing then that we have such a high priest, a great high priest, that is passed into heavens, Jesus, Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, if you don't have the attitude of living like the New Testament says Christians ought to live, that's, a, that's something that doesn't make any difference at all. This happens to the person that's dedicated, that's a saint, that serves God. We don't take the view that's a false view that Roman Catholicism has of sainthood. A saint is a member of the church like he's a priest of Christ. He lives a holy life as the New Testament teaches Christian living. The life of Christ is to be our goal. Have you never sat down and even in prayer just long to say, help me be like Christ? Or long for the day in glory when you'll be like Christ? And never will be any struggles anymore to be holy and to be sanctified. So 1 Peter 2, 21 leaves, leaving us an example, Christ has, that we should follow in his steps. Only then is holiness preserved when we take that viewpoint toward God and his word. It's an imperative, that is, holiness is, for God's children. Verse 16 makes that clear, as I started out with, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Notice this. In your daily study of the Bible, how many times the Bible says the same thing in many different ways? And I've often wondered, why did God in his wisdom do that? Well, it's because some things hit people in different ways and caused them to take note of it. It's like referring to the church as a church, or as a spiritual body, or as a kingdom, or as a temple. It helps us understand by looking at it in all those different ways what the church actually is. And so it is when it comes down to our holiness, our sanctification in Christ. In Leviticus eleven forty four, For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. That hasn't changed, brethren, but the gospel system makes it so that we can be. Notice Leviticus 19, 2. Speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel, Say unto them, ye shall be holy, for I am the Lord your God, am holy. Now that was an insufficient law to do that. Paul said that if a law could bring salvation, that one could, but all you have to do is read the book of Hebrews. If no other, no, it couldn't. 
It was simply there's a system of shadows and types, a schoolmaster to bring us into Christ until the real perfect law of liberty, the will of Christ, could be set down. But nevertheless, you had this business of the Israelite under the law live like the law said. And you read again in Leviticus 20 and 7, Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. That has not changed. And in verse 26, And ye shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy. God's authored a situation to where mere human beings, as weak and finite as we are, if we will humble ourselves and believe and obey the gospel, we can become holy even as he is holy. So God commanded that Israel have no dealings with the world, no covenants with other nations, no mixed marriages, no entwining oneself up with people who cared not about him. And it should be characteristic of all of us seeing that was written aforetime for our learning, Romans 15, 4. Holiness is thus enjoined on those in Christ. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar or purchased people. Children of God are God's representatives on this earth, and we are instruments through which God converts men to Christ. Romans 10, 12 through 15. Now that means that if we are to present the gospel as the saving power of God, we can't mix ourselves up with the ways of the world. Holiness is reflected to all by our example of putting into practice the truth of the New Testament. In fact, if you look at Matthew 5, 16, our Lord's own teaching, God's not glorified in our obedience to the truth, then we're fruitless. And if we don't obey the truth, we have nothing to bear that what, as far as what God wants us to bear. So as we close the lesson, This fits every phase of our life, whether you were just converted or you're thinking about being converted and the very meaning of conversion, or whether it's a man or a woman, father or mother, a boy or girl. If you're outside of Christ, you're still in your sins. You're separated from Him. If you're in Christ, then you must be seeking day by day to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for that's the way you preserve holiness, and you're holy even as God has commanded us to be as He is holy. We studied in this sermon how to become a Christian. If you don't today, you still remain in a lost condition, separated from Him without the hope of eternal life. As a child of God, I simply ask, are you living a holy life? Are you truly a saint? If you have sinned, we urge you to humble yourselves and repent of it and confess it. Pray God for forgiveness. And thus, if you're subject to the gospel call, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.